oh, I want to watch this, but it's, you know, right in the middle. Well, sure. It's always on. Oh, here we go. We're now live. Awesome. 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 Guys, it is Tuesday night. It's a little after seven o'clock central. It is time for another weekly episode of Conversations with Commodores. And I have got Megan Cato with us this evening. Megan, thank you for making some time coming out of Indianapolis tonight. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. You, as I do with all my guests, I ask for certain background information because I don't know everybody and their stories. But my gosh, you must have had some fun, if you want to call it fun. I know you were busy, but your time on the campus was very well spent. How in the world, and we got to start right here, how in the world did you play lacrosse, keep up with your studies, and be a student trainer in one, the same calendar year? How did you do that? Yeah, um, it was uh, it was an interesting year. It was um, a lot going on all at once. The good news is I'd had kind of two years to build up to that. That was my junior year. Mm-hmm. Um, so lacrosse started out as a club sport. Mm-hmm. And I never played until I got to Vanderbilt. Um, I came from upstate New York. Men's lacrosse was big. We didn't have women's. Um, but I had been um, an athlete and a classmate on my freshman hall came around and said, hey, are you looking for something to do? We need more players on our lacrosse team. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I don't know how to play. I don't have a stick. She said, I've got more than one stick. You can borrow mine. Let's go. So that's kind of where it all started. Um, And then we found out as sophomores that we were going to be elevated to varsity our junior year. Um, So that was, (laughs) no, no, it was was, club. And then you go to a NCAA level. Wow. It it had been a club for, for a good long time. And, and my predecessors in the club had worked hard to um, make it a strong program, make it real visible. Mm -hmm. And I think had done some lobbying with the athletic department um, to to get it elevated, but um, it was it it was definitely a transition. We started as sophomores working out um, in in the in the weight rooms and started mixing into McGugan a little bit. Um, but then when it really started, uh, it was. It was interesting for me because that was when I officially became a trainer as well was the start of my junior year. So um, in some ways, I didn't know any better. I just kind of just dove in. So I started out with football. I went to Bell Buckle football camp. And then um, it was football in the fall and then lacrosse in the spring. But as you know, all sports have practices in the off seasons. So uh, mostly I would do our running practices in the mornings before class. Mm -hmm. I would do our lifting workouts on my own time. And then um, I I would get to practice whenever I could, but um, it it just training took priority at that point. And then um, in the spring, they let me just play. Although uh, it was beneficial because the lacrosse team didn't travel with a student or really didn't even have a student trainer. Um, mm-hmm. They just kind of threw me in. I know I put a picture in there of me taping ankles before mm-hmm. an away game. Uh, <laughs> they knew they could use me as both. And so it, 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 it's, was a great experience. I don't necessarily recommend it because it just can't be, you can't keep it up. Um, There was a meeting at the end of the season, end of the lacrosse season, where essentially the training staff and the coaching staff got together and made me choose. So, Megan, you had to have given up sleep or food or socialization. You had to have given up something. I don't know how. I mean, you must not have required a lot of sleep that year. Or maybe at the end of the year, you were so wiped out, you just just (laughs) crashed. There, there were a lot of early mornings um, up before all of my sweet mates. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think I, I do better when I'm busy. Um, mm-hmm. That was one of the reasons I started playing lacrosse was I, essentially I was bored. You know, I had class and 
social stuff, but there was a lot of time in between. So um, it, wow. it worked, uh, you know, when they, I was sad when I had to make the choice. Mm -hmm. um, when it came down to it, I loved lacrosse, but I was a goalie. I was already second string at that point, and we were recruiting more every year. And then my work as a trainer, um, I started to develop a more clear path of what, what I wanted to do as a career. Originally, I had gone in thinking I wanted to uh, be an orthopedic surgeon and got a lot of experience with surgeons. But working day to day as a trainer, I realized you know, what I wanted to do was that that hands on beginning to end incremental change sort of um, treatment. So wow. it uh, it really changed my life in that regard that, I, that it helped me figure out where I wanted to go in the future. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it was an impactful year. And what you guys don't know is also during that year, Megan served on the Nashville City Council and she worked <laughs> on construction projects down in the Gulch. That's but right. anyway, <laughs> Megan, we got some Commodores in here. OJ Fleming sends his regards. Hi, OJ. How was Ellen? We got Jim Cunningham. We got Coach Gary Shepard. Thank you, fellas. For We got Megan Serto here. She was a trainer, a lacrosse player, a Vanderbilt grad, and does so much more. But before we we jump back to the good old days. Tell folks about your your lovely family and what you do these days. Well, um, I live here in Indianapolis. Uh, we live very close to downtown. So if anybody's ever in for an event, we host lots of sporting events here. Mm -hmm. Let me know. I'm, I'm, I have easy access to downtown. But um, I was uh, lured to the state of Indiana by my now husband. <laughs> uh, we've been married for 18 years. Um, my husband, Dave, is a judge here in Indianapolis. Um, and we have four kids. Peter is 15 and a sophomore in high school. Lucy is 13 and in eighth grade. Kate is 11 in sixth grade. And Gabriel is eight and in third grade. So that's a busy house right there. <laughs> it is. And when does your 15 year old get his license? Because that'll be a game changer. You know, he was just looking up today what he needed to do to get his permit. He was a little slow on that, but he's also a late birthday. He's a summer birthday. Mm -hmm. So he won't turn 16 until July. So, well, you got, you got a little bit of time, but we, we need to get that license. We need another driver in the house. I, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Well, I know that you, your day job is you're a physical therapist, as well as a mother, a wife, a friend, a neighbor, a, a, probably a community uh, volunteer, but you also serve on the licensing board uh, for the state of Indiana for physical therapy. Is there anything else that we've missed in, the, <laughs> in all of your, your jobs and responsibilities? Um. <laughs> No, well, it's like you said, it's I've spent a lot of time chairing the PTO. I'm treasurer for the Cub Scouts. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, I said earlier, I, I can't not be busy. Um, I chaired school commission. I just had an unsuccessful campaign for vice president, board of directors of the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. But uh, uh -oh. who do we yeah. need to talk to? We need a recount. I know. I well, it was it, the nominating committee came to me, so and I knew I was up against a a heavy hitter, so mm -hmm. it felt good just to really be in that conversation mm -hmm. at all. So sure. uh, well, that's I'm sure that's your colleagues' way of saying that they think very highly of you and, and what you do, Megan. Let's pause right there and kind of pivot. How do you go from New York to Nashville? What was it about Vanderbilt, and when did when did Vanderbilt get on your radar as a high school student to even consider coming down south? Yeah, so I actually grew up uh, until eighth grade in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, at the time, uh, my parents were from Pennsylvania. And like most states, everyone's a fan of, you know, there it was Chapel Hill or state. So being a transplant there, um, I became a fan of Duke. <laughs> I chose that middle ground. Um, so I had always considered 
Duke for college um, when I was going into eighth grade. My dad worked for Corning Glass. And so he was moved back to Corning headquarters. And we lived in one of, I guess you could call it a suburb in painted post New York. There are some lovely Native American names for towns up there. Um, but it was actually, there were two small high schools and there was a guy from East High, I went to West, who graduated ahead of me and said, oh, he, he was going to Vanderbilt. And at the time I had a couple on my list. Um, Notre Dame was on there. I, I had an uncle who played football at Notre Dame. So we've always been fans and you know, growing up Catholic, that's kind of <laughs> where you go. Um, but it was kind of at that point that this person mentioned Vanderbilt. And I said, you know, I don't know that much about it. So I started looking at it um, and it really ticked a lot of the boxes for me and in, in ways that say, I loved Notre Dame, but it gets really cold there. And I loved Duke, but it's kind of out there on its own. And Vanderbilt had being in the middle of the city and having, um, I really liked having the kind of the big time athletics. Um, and then, so went through the application process and it turns out that uh, Vanderbilt made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So. <laughs> Well, Notre Dame and Duke's loss was certainly Vanderbilt's gain. And at that time, had you been thinking physical therapy or, or um, when did at, that kind of percolate into the picture? That, you know, like I said, I went in thinking uh, I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. I had grown up kind of around some orthopedic doctors um, for a foot and hip issue that I had. And that's typically what you find, especially in therapists is everybody had some sort of experience either themselves or with a family member or um, yeah, something they saw. And so I, I was prepared to go to medical school and then it was really my, my training days that, that turned that for me, that I, I started to see the other side because as you know, as student trainers, we're there from the beginning to the end. We do our, the, the, pre-practice treatment, you know, we're taping ankles, we're there during the practice, and then we're there afterwards too. So I, I really started to enjoy that rather than the idea of surgery, you know, you're kind of one and done at that point. Um, I liked that day-to-day -day, um, really working somebody through the process of recovery. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where it changed. And, and, you know, that was, interesting for me because um, coming to that decision a little late, I, I found that I couldn't apply right as a senior. Um, and part of it was because I, I was so busy. Um, they say that PT schools are harder to get into than medical schools because there are fewer. Um, and so one of the requirements that I found that most schools had were around 200 hours of volunteer time in physical therapy clinics. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, first, I didn't know about that requirement. Second, I didn't have time to volunteer yeah. in clinics between everything else that I was doing. So I graduated on time and it was um, really great. It was kind of weird at that point to make a decision to kind of almost take a gap year. Um, and so that was when they offered me the opportunity to come back as a student trainer for that 97 season with football. Um, so I did that uh, three mornings a week. I volunteered um, twice at the Vandy Stallworth Rehab Hospital and once in the pediatric clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of a lot of unpaid work. Um, I took a couple classes that some of the schools required, and then I worked at the cooker. So really, oh wow! I had to make money somewhere. Yeah, but um, and it was close to everything else I was doing. Yeah. So sadly, um, the yeah. cooker and rotiers and exit in and all of those places are going away or have been demolished. I know. It's I saw it recently as this week. Exit in is closing its doors this next month. Yep. It's it's not 
the same as it was when we were there. No, all in the uh, the mind or in the the name of progress, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Well, Megan, let's. I know you were an athlete as a, as a child and growing up. When you got to Vanderbilt, how did you? That just doesn't go away. Being an athlete or being competitive, you pretty much have that your whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, but how did you channel that as a freshman? Uh, at Vanderbilt, trying to get acclimated academically and everything else you were trying to do. Yeah, um, it was it was a very different experience. I remember the my parents helped move me in, and then they left. And I remember kind of sitting in our dorm rooms, thinking, well, "What do we do now? Like, there's no one to tell us where to go or what to do or when to eat or you know." So. Um, I do think I was a little lost at first. Um, Mm -hmm. I did come into some, some really great friends. And in fact, uh, one of the girls on my freshman hall, uh, for the past two reunions, our 20th and 25th, she lives on Long Island and we've, uh, shared an Airbnb and come without our husbands and families and (laughs) just had a good time. So, you know, I had some good friends in that regard. And you find that some people, you start falling into activities. Um, That friend in particular went out for crew. And then it was pretty early that that, um, I was approached about playing lacrosse. And I think that was just a real game changer for me to say, okay, I have something to do. I have something that, you know, it's going to keep me active. It's going to introduce me to a lot of different people and, um, you know, give me some place to kind of channel that competition. I guess the other thing that I did um, pick up pretty early on was being on concert committee. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, I bet, I bet. You know, it's when you get to, to any college or university and you get out of your cocoon from childhood and you're some other part of the country and mom and dad aren't there, like you said, you you probably kind of feel like you're floating out in the ocean and looking for a buoy or a, an island or something mm-hmm. to cling on to. And, and getting into groups and organizations, I think, is a, is a fantastic way to find an identity, to find friends. And with, with me, with playing football, you immediately, obviously, you know, that's why I was at school because of the scholarship. But then you immediately are with your new friends and your lifelong friends. And it sounds like some of the ones maybe on your hall or maybe who you met through lacrosse may still be part of your, your, your crew, if you will. But here's, where where did you live freshman year? Were were y'all, was Fred, were freshmen still in Branscombe? Yeah, I lived in Stapleton. Okay, sure, sure. We lived, the guys, I don't know if it was still this way when you were there, but my years, the guys lived in Lupton and the women lived, lived in the other three uh, parts of the quadrangle. That's the way it was when I was there. Yeah. Well, I was I was on campus for the South Carolina game a few weeks ago. And as I do on Friday afternoons when I get up there early enough, I walk the campus because I just think it's a magical time of the year in the fall. And so I always find my way to Branscombe just to see what what's different. Well, clearly you can't get in without security check, but I had some young guy let me in uh, anyway. But with it's still largely the same, except it's completely different. And I don't know if that makes sense, but like in the lobby, it's it's quarantined off the, uh, I don't know if it's still a cafeteria or whatever it is on the far side, mm-hmm. uh, separates through the lobby with all these doors and the people sitting there. But anyway, just, you know, it brings back a flood of memories. And I bet when you went for your 25th, it probably, wherever you were on campus, where, while many things seem the same, there's so much that's changed every year. You notice yes. between the sorority and fraternity houses, it's all pedestrian, which I, I personally think is wonderful. I agree. It, it was it was fascinating to go back, just the difference even between our 20th and 25th, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because, of course, I lived in, in Towers mm-hmm. my, my junior year, <laughs> and that's, uh, yep. that's, that's completely different, and um, I, I am still kind of amazed that, that Branscombe is still there. Of, mm-hmm. of all the dorms, mm-hmm. it, it, it just has that such a dated look on the outside of it, at least that um, that that was part of our discussion that we're thinking, how long, how long does Branscombe have before? Well, they- you know, my, my thought was, and this is just me, 
Because of where it's geographically located, I suspect it will be a nightmare uh, to tear it all down and to build whatever they're going to build because they're going to have to shift traffic, foot and uh, vehicle traffic for however long. But but anyway, I'm sure that's got to be on the short list of the next set of buildings after whatever Hogwarts looking building gets built on <laughs> in place of, of the well, towers. My friend and I had a discussion on the way back to our apartment one night uh, in October in October this year, just saying, you know, they really need to do like a one month back on campus where we can all come live our college lives a little bit. Again, you mm -hmm. live in the dorms, you hang out, um, you know, you go to some classes, almost like that Maymester mm -hmm. feel yeah. um, that is, we said, especially as, as people retire, that you can come back and you, none of this distance learning. We want to come back and live on campus and and you know it's funny that you say that. Several summers ago, my, one of my daughters played college lacrosse and she went to the Vanderbilt camp. And they stayed in Branscombe. They stayed on the third floor of Lupton, which was my floor. She was a, a, a few doors down from my room, but we walk in there, and maybe some fresh paint is about the only difference with those cinder block walls. Yep. Those just, it's just, it's incredible. And this is not a knock on Vanderbilt directly, but for what they charge retail for the kids to go to school there, you'd think it'd be a little bit upda updated, but that's just the charm of, of the quadrangle of Branscombe. <laughs> yes, the char charm is the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Megan, let's, let's backtrack a little bit and I want you to, to share, if you will, what was it like that first semester of just getting acclimated to being a, a college kid for the first time away from home, finding your way as you started to, to, to allude to, and then the, the academic side of things. Was your high school experience, was it an academic oriented program at home or was it were you finding yourself having to do a lot of catch-up work? Well, um, I can tell you that I was I was actually at Vanderbilt on an academic scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, so that was helpful. You know, I think I was I was pretty well prepared. The my high school was pretty small, but the area was headquarters for two Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of executives kids mm -hmm. in the area and they had a lot of really great programs like um uh it's between my junior and senior year of high school i did a an internship through the new york academy of science and um i, I was the only one that wanted biology most of the people wanted engineering and they would take them to Corning, which was right there. Um, I ended up at the National Fisheries Research and Development Lab in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, uh, <laughs> which is entirely landlocked in coal country. Yeah. And I have no idea why there's a fisheries lab there. Um, <laughs> but they they farm some salmon and they have some sturgeon. And I spent a summer down there, like literally with a freezer full of dead fish and a bassomatic and um, nice. ended up with a research project out of that. But um, so I, I'd say that I, I was pretty well prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, I will have to say that freshman year was my worst academically. And I think some of that has to do with, you know, you're taking all of these general courses that maybe you're not terribly interested in, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had, I had taken Latin for three years, but I had to take another language. So I took Spanish. My worst grade ever is in like Spanish 102. <laughs> it's it's languages just aren't my thing. <laughs> I know this. Um, I'm science and math oriented. So um, that that was kind of hard. And I think just getting into that um, routine of, of keeping up with with the work in between the days, um, mm -hmm. you know, where in high school we had every class every day. So then having the days off, but they're not days off, you need to be doing the reading and and things like that. Um, I do have to say that that I got uh, Professor Locke's 
philosophy class on, on ethics. And, and I loved that class. We spent a lot of time as a group with some friends studying for that, but, um, you know, he was just a, a figure on campus. Um, and I did, uh, somehow as a freshman managed to get into the, the music course, the Beethoven and the Beatles course. Wow. Wow. So that, that was, you know, and it, it, a lot of it's just a lottery, how it fits into your schedule. But so those were, those were two of my favorite courses, um, and actually helped me integrate with some other friends. Um, I, another one of my best friends who we worked on that, that music course together. Um, and we would go over to tower records because there was no text. It was CDs. So oh, yeah. we go over to Tower Records and buy the CDs and share them usually um, between us so that we didn't know it. I knew this was going to happen. This is Gabriel. This hey, is Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> good to see you, man. How are you? Good. Good, good. All right, buddy. You got to go. No worries. <laughs> well, that, that Tower Records was built my junior year when I was living in the Towers. And so okay. my... My first CDs were purchased from right, right there. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, uh, I think I was ready for freshman year. I just, I had to figure out how to put it all together really. And, and I found out that for me, I needed more structure and consistency. Mm -hmm. Like maybe it's just that, that little bit of ADD that I have that <laughs> left to my own devices. Um, well, I don't know, always get anything done. How many of us as freshmen come in are completely organized and we know how to handle all of the, the different stresses from the different parts of being on your own? That's what freshman year really is all about is kind of creating your identity. Mm -hmm. If there's parts of, of what you didn't like about high school things, well, you can just leave all that at home because nobody knows that about you or whatever you don't like. But when did when did football or basketball or any of the other sports come onto your radar your freshman year or or did it it did um you know and unfortunately there was a sad tradition of not many students going to the games um oh that's been decades and decades yeah. so you know i always tried my best to um rally some folks to get to a football game because I was interested. Um, I think that year it was a lot more basketball. Um, we had just come off of, I think a sweet 16 run the year yeah. before. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I remember actually camping out in Memorial gym for tickets. Wow. Um, you remember the maybe, game or which I think it was Kentucky. Yeah. That's, that's, Pretty, pretty normal. Yeah. So, and I thought that was just um, fascinating and strange. Now we didn't have to go far being right, right. <laughs> living in, in Branscombe, you know, it's just across the street, but um, having, having a whole bunch of people sleeping in the hallway for tickets was certainly an experience. And, but later, did you get the benefit of being a student trainer, not have to to sleep out or camp out for those tickets? Well, yeah. Well, and now <laughs> that was the, uh, the other thing I didn't, I didn't make it to say as many basketball games as I'd mm -hmm. like while I was there because there was so much other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. you know, and, and as much as I liked it, you know, you, you have to make these choices. So, um, but I did, that was one of the big pushes for me to look into the training program was, you know, I want to go to the game. I want to be excited about the game. I want to I want to understand, you know, who the players are and what's going on and, and um, really be more a part of it than, you know, show up at mm -hmm. in the third quarter and leave by the fourth. <laughs> you know? well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. When did you first get involved as a trainer uh, or friends with anybody in the football program? When did all that become part of your, your routine? Um, it would have been sophomore year. Um, and I'm trying, I was trying to remember what really, um, got me there. I, I'm not sure if it was you know, an, like an ad or an article in the hustler, 
Mm -hmm. um, or anything like that. But I remember getting the information about um, about the becoming a trainer. Um, we have another visitor. Tell me, what, come yes, on. What do you need? No worries. Guys, we're talking with Megan Serto. She is in Indianapolis. She was a lacrosse player, a student trainer, now a physical therapist, and we're just running through some good times. We are now to the point of her story, her sophomore year, and the football program is now on her radar. We're trying to figure out or remember how. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do think it was um, maybe a flyer or something in the Hustler, mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe a friend, uh, mm -hmm. my roommate probably brought this to me. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, at that point too, we had also, as a lacrosse team, started transitioning a little bit. Um, that was our recruiting year. So, um, you know, we were already starting some of our workouts over at McGugan. Well, I was going to ask you, did you have access to not only the weight room, but the training and any of the other facilities within the McGugan Center? Uh, a little bit. We, we did mm -hmm. more the weight room than anything mm -hmm. else that first year mm -hmm. or that kind of transitional year. Um, but the, uh, it, I just lost my train of thought there for a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, but, uh, yeah. So that, that year we did a lot of, um, recruiting. I had a lot of recruits stay with me. I had mm -hmm. a roommate who, um, could make herself absent. <laughs> um, and it, we had a nice big room over in West Hall on, mm -hmm. on Peabody. So I actually had a lot of recruits stay with me. So that was really, you know, um, I would tour them through McGugan. We'd tour them through campus. We'd do mm -hmm. all these things. Um, and then to become a student trainer, you, you actually have to go through this education and selection process. Um, who was the head trainer that year? Uh, Paul Federici. Fed. Oh, Fed, Fed came on during the time I was there, 86 to 90, mm -hmm. as, as a student or okay. as a graduate student. And he was mm -hmm. under John Norwig. Mm -hmm. Big, as you probably know, either know him personally or know of him. He's been with the Pittsburgh Steelers for almost 30 years as their head trainer. Yeah. But I, I remember. And Fed... If I remember correctly, went off to Iowa and then maybe to the Seahawks or vice versa. Vice versa, yeah. He went to the Seahawks and now he's at Iowa, I believe. Yeah. But um, yeah, so and in fact, Boz, who now does all the football, mm -hmm. he was basketball back at that mm -hmm. time too. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we kind of th there was a schedule where we would come in. And we would learn about some of the modalities, some of the equipment, um, some of the treatments. There was a, an infamous day where we had to sit with our feet in the, um, the ice bath um, oh. for a certain amount of time, yeah. um, which is really uncomfortable. I don't know how the players do it, but yeah. um, I, I did not like that very much. But uh, after we went through, it, it was six weeks, couple months. Um, then over the summer, we, we learned whether we were selected um, mm -hmm. as student trainers or not. So then that fall, when you came back for your junior year, you were part of the crew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you, um, when did actually, you start interacting with the ball players? Was it any that summer or was it? Well, it was, it was a little bit during the, um, during, during the educational process, the selection process. But then, um, let's see, which summers did I stay? Got me thinking now. Um, I think I did stay that summer. I think I took organic chemistry that summer. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, you did start, as you know, many or most of the people that are around during the summer sessions are athletes. Yeah. So um, I think I got to know some of them through that. And then, um, you know, they, they dump you into bell buckle first thing. Well, that's where I want to go. Okay. If you were a player, you have certain memories. If you were a coach, if you were a manager, if you were, if you were a trainer, it's all different memories and different perspectives. I don't know of a single ball player who could honestly say they enjoyed 
any part of Bell Buckle. <laughs> Where were you housed? Tell, how long were you there? What were your responsibilities? Um, it was a week and there was, I think it was, the players were in the, the like student dorms, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And we were in some sort of other dorms, like teachers or staff that, that lived on the campus. So mm -hmm. we were um, in a side building um, and the one one of my greatest kind of moments of of clarity but i think i also blame this now for the way that i pack um to go on a trip is packing the training room to go to bell buckle mm -hmm. and I, I i don't know if the how much the players see of this but it's the whole weight room and the whole training room and you know, you've got everything you could possibly need. And, and that was a big eye opener for me to go, wow, we're just, we're, we're going to take it all, right? <laughs> and then the ball players, the football players, they see it at McGugan. They see it at Bell Buckle. They have no clue, no concept how it goes magically from A to B. And but you're the magic. You're part of the <laughs> crew of many and that could not have been an easy task. No, and it was just the the sheer scale of it to think how many cases of tape, how many cases of pre-wrap, how many cases of Gatorade, mm -hmm. how many coolers do you need? We've got to drive the golf cart up into the truck. You know, <laughs> all these things that um, you're literally just taking the whole building with you. And then it has to get unpacked. Um, so, so that was kind of a just a, a quite an experience um and then from there of course it was hot and I think it was particularly hot that year so they they moved the two a days so that they were really early in the morning I want to say they were six to eight a.m mm -hmm. and then the afternoon practices may have been like four to six or something like that um, so there was a lot of nothing in between in the days. Now, did you have to deal with uh, the standing water in the showers or in the dorms? Did you deal with that? There, there was some standing water. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, with a number of girls showering, sometimes it's hard to tell whether that's hair or whatever else, <laughs> the plumbing. I think we really had a better living experience. Oh, sure you did. Um, sure. I, I do remember it was so hot that particular year that the players um, moved their mattresses into the uh, chapel <laughs> mm -hmm. and because the chapel was air conditioned. Uh -huh. So what about the helicopters having to well, uh, get the water off of the field. Do you remember, were you there for that year? No. Yeah, there was one year that the uh, local TV station, somebody called in favor. This was under Coach Donardo, I believe, where there was either it had rained heavily or for whatever reason, the practice fields were soaked. Well, that morning, two news station helicopters magically showed up <laughs> and dispersed a lot of the the water. Megan, I want to welcome. We got Greg Simmons. We've got Kenny Cole. Guys, for y'all just joining us, we've got Megan Serto. Megan was a lacrosse player and a student trainer in the mid to late 90s. She's out of Indianapolis right now. And Megan, what was it that was eye-opening or what was what were the the on-the-job uh, training, if you will, that that served you well? from working with Paul Federici and, and being a student trainer that year? Um, so a lot of what I learned um, when it came to the treatment side of things, mm -hmm. we used a lot of the modalities, the e-stim, the ultrasound, things like that. And what's fascinating to me is I knew how to work it. I knew what to use it for, but mm -hmm. I didn't fully understand the the all the details and it wasn't until I was in physical therapy school and we had to take entire classes on modalities mm -hmm. that it all clicked it all made sense to say 
I get it. This is why we were doing this. This is why the different settings were, were here and there. So um, they did a really good job of, of making us you know, competent to use the equipment. Um, but you know, there's only so much you can teach when it's you know, a, a couple hours, a couple days a week right. when you're leading right. up to it. Um, you know, I, I, I still feel like I haven't done it in a long time, but I still feel like I could tape a mean ankle. <laughs> I, I, I am a bit of a perfectionist and there is definitely an art to taping an ankle. And if you can get those flat lines and uh, a nice tight fit, it was, it, it was something that made me happy to see that. Um, and then also if, you know, if you had a line behind your station, uh -huh. you were doing pretty well, you know, right, it, it, right. you know, and especially if it were, um, you know, some of the players that, that saw more action. Sure, sure. If you want to pause for it right now, if Gabriel is still within earshot, tell him to bring the tape and the pre-wrap and let's go. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had that. That's the other thing I've realized is how expensive that stuff is. Is that right? Um, is to that buy right? it just, you know, I'm as a, as a training room, you get uh -huh. discounts on cases of sure. it, but um, I've bought it for, I guess, two years ago, my oldest was having a lot of foot and ankle trouble in, in cross country. So I was taping him and, and doing some stuff and, you know, using some kinesio tape and, you know, I, I guess I got stingy because <laughs> The $40 a roll adds up real quick. It does. <laughs> like, no, you keep that on until it falls off. Megan, what were some of the better game memories? Uh, whether it was, I know y'all played Notre Dame, you played Tennessee uh, during that time. What was it about those games or any other games that were real memorable for you? Well, um, so for Notre Dame, like I said, I had my uncle uh, mm -hmm. actually played at Notre Dame. So I grew up a Notre Dame fan. Um, so Notre Dame stadium, it, you know, kind of has this mis mystery to it. Um, and it, he was, uh, backup quarterback to Joe Theismann. So that's his, his claim to fame. But, um, so I'd always wanted to, you know, be there for that game. And it turns out I did not have the seniority to travel to that game. But there was a kind of an arrangement um, that if you could get there, they'd let you work. Now, you couldn't necessarily stay with the team. Right. If there was room, there could, you could. Um, sure. The girls' rooms were often <laughs> not, not as full. So I stayed. I, I had a car at that point. Um, I hoped that it would make it all the way from Nashville to South Bend. Um, and I, re I do remember that was the first time I'd ever driven through Indianapolis. I remember seeing it and thinking I was almost there and I'm just not. And that was, if I remember correctly, that was in September of 95. We lost, I think 41 to nothing that game. I was at that game. Yeah. That's how I remember it. We found out that my wife, my, my wife, um, was pregnant with our first kid that weekend. Oh, that's just, fantastic. You know, just weird, yep. weird memories. I had never been to Notre Dame's campus before or their, their stadium. And that was before they did any upgrades. And if you remember, it was all wooden bleachers and the seats were literally 18 inches apart. Oh, yeah. People were a lot smaller when that <laughs> stadium was, was created. But seeing Touchdown Jesus in the background, I mean, it's, it's a cool environment. It really is, even well, if you get your head handed to you. I, I end up there um, rather regularly now. I, I married a Notre Dame grad. Um, and so, and it's not that far from here. So in fact, we were just up for the Clemson game. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, so that, that oh. was a fun one to attend. Yeah, I bet. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, you know, being at Notre Dame and being able to, you know, be down in, in the locker rooms and mm -hmm. underneath the stadium and throw the ball around a little bit before mm -hmm. the teams came out, that was, that was a lot of fun for me. Um, I, I do remember um, playing Alabama. That was kind of a, a big deal that we, I wanted, you know, to go see. We didn't, 
you you had to be selected as a student trainer to go to mm -hmm. the away games. Um, they would usually take about half of us, and some of the big games were done based on seniority. Mm -hmm. um, and I was chosen to go to the Alabama game, and we played at UAB that year. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was that that was a little bit of a letdown. I do remember um, that was uh, Bill Marin Angels fake punt touchdown. So that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. um, just being there for that. But, you know, I was disappointed in my, <laughs> my overall Alabama experience. Yeah, they, they used to play back then at Legion Field, mm -hmm. which was, it still is in a horrible part of town. It's a terrible stadium that should have been torn down before you even uh, traveled. But now UAB has a really nice new, uh, new stadium that you'd be proud to to be part of a, one of those games. Yeah. Um, what I, I guess, Megan, as we move along, we've got we've got a few more minutes, and I appreciate you running through some of your time there. I want to switch back away from from football responsibilities and just talk about campus life. Uh, you've mentioned one of your professors, who obviously was well known with philosophy. Were there any particular classes or other professors that really have made an imprint on you and kind of setting you on your path? Were there certain buildings or certain places on campus that bring back good memories? Yeah, well, um, once I really got through like that first year, year and a half, um, it, I was kind of all in on my major. Um, so I was, at the time it was psychology with a concentration in neuroscience. It's now just switched to a, a neuroscience major. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the psychology building, mm -hmm. which at the time was fantastic because that was one of the newest buildings on campus. Um, the only problem was is it was pretty much the exact opposite corner of campus from McGugan. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's mm -hmm. over by Kassam, yeah. so it, yeah. or what used to be Kassam. Yeah. So... Um, that was that was a distance and you know especially senior year I lived in Morgan so it was Morgan to the psychology building and back to McGugan and did you a wear a pedometer did you I wish that? I wish I'd had the Fitbit back then yeah. you know I would have felt really good. more than 10,000 steps those days I know I know yeah. um yeah and I always had because of what I was doing I always had early morning classes. Like mm -hmm. I think only once did I ever not have an 8 a.m. class. Sure, <laughs> so sure. it was always mornings. Um, but yeah, as I as I got more into the psychology program uh, or neuroscience, um, there was a, a husband and wife professor team that really, they had been really highly recruited and they came and we really, really thought in this intro to uh, neuroscience class, we were talking about the brain and planes of the brain and mm -hmm. how it's cut differently if you're looking at it. And she had this table, it was covered and there were these three mounds and we really thought she was gonna pull a brain out and no, she pulled out cantaloupe and cut the cantaloupe and, uh, you know, <laughs> but they, they were a lot of fun um, and really, you know, it guided me along the way. I do remember my last final ever um, was the same. It was the last slot of senior year. So it was a Saturday morning final. Mm -hmm. Same day I took my GREs. Same day I had to turn in a 20 page term paper for that same class. And it was a one question final. Um, it was developmental neuroanatomy and it was explain the development of the human nervous system from conception to birth. That's it? That's it. Oh my God. <laughs> you might as well have just said, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> well, well, and you know, okay. So it's everything you've done that semester right, from right. beginning to end. So right. yeah, it that was that was a that was a really long day, but um yeah. I made it and I did well and that always kind of stuck with me that mm -hmm. you know it's it's important to learn the little pieces, yeah. but you've got to be able to put it all together. You got to see the big picture. That's exactly, exactly right. What about some hangout spots? Where did you and your friends find yourself on those rare moments you didn't have 
X, Y, and Z responsibilities for a few minutes? Well, um, I have to say as, as young freshmen, uh, we partook at, uh, at Gillies a little bit, a um, little bit of drink or drown at Gillies. Um, and then we did go to the exit in and gold rush um, mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, many of my, my girlfriends were in sororities. So sometimes we would, we would do things with sure. their groups, yeah. but, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of, um, after later it got to be more house parties or, mm -hmm. you know, things, in, things in people's dorm rooms, but, um, and, and while the statute of limitations is definitely expired in the state of Tennessee for anything you may or may not admit to tonight. I know that you have at least four who will be watching this later on YouTube. So we'll just leave it. We'll leave it right there. But right. Megan, I don't mean to, to switch around on you, but I meant to ask you of any interactions you had with Coach Donardo or the coaching staff uh, during that time that you were a student trainer. Did it? Did you ever make their radar? Did it ever... Uh, me, did you ever have uh, opportunities where you were, uh, I guess, called upon to do training stuff? Um, you know, Donardo was on his way out as mm -hmm. I was coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we had Rod Dauhauer mm -hmm. and, you know, he brought on a good staff, which then kind of morphed into the next coaching staff. Um, uh, Coach Woody, Woody. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um I do remember Coach Harrison. Uh, he he was one that always interacted a lot with the student trainers. Um, he I think has like nine kids of his own or something like wow. that. He had a lot of kids, but at pre almost every single practice, he would walk up to us and and ask what flavor the Kool Aid was today. What what, what flavor is the Kool Aid? Um, and you know the the big um, spigoted coolers. Mm -hmm. they're really heavy when they're full of water and ice and mm -hmm. you know you're trying to mix the Gatorade which either came in a powder or a, a mm -hmm. concentrate and sometimes you'd use the um, cup sleeve and put it on your arm stick it in there well <laughs> if coach Harrison was around we always knew that he would pick up our our, our Kool-Aid jugs and uh -huh. shake them around and, and get them mixed up for us. So, nice. so he was always a, a really sweet guy. And then, um, you know, uh, I had worked with Todd Suttles mm -hmm. um, on my own, you know, weight training mm -hmm. path with lacrosse. So um, I really enjoyed getting to know him more with, with football. Um, and uh, Woody was always great to work for. He was always, kind and personable to the student trainers you know i think he understood you know we don't we don't have to be here right. <laughs> um you know we're we're doing the best that we can and uh he was always always seemed to have a smile at least for us i know it wasn't always that way for the players but um he had a lot of personality and and i liked of, of all the head coaches i liked being around him the most i think he's the most memorable for me. And like I said, that one picture, I'm really not sure where that Woody ball in 97 sign came from or if, it was, ever, or if it was ever returned. Um, you know, the, uh, the management, the manager staff was always awesome with us too. Um, like I said, they loaned us those uniforms for Halloween mm -hmm. and I never realized, you know, kind of how much fun wearing pads was you, you could bump in a, into a lot of stuff and, you, and not really you, feel it you certainly can Megan we've got George White and Gene Keenan have joined us thank you fellas we're talking of course with Megan Serto we've got just a couple more minutes uh, Megan do, do you have a, a crystal ball prediction for any of your four children might they find their way to Nashville and the, dawn the black and gold any predictions you know, at this point? I, I would love that. Um, their father's making a really tough sell on Notre Dame too. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, we, we've kind of told them, look, you don't, I don't expect you to go on my path. This is your path. Figure out what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, there are so many great schools out there and we made those decisions because they were right for us at that time. Yeah. Um, you know, every time I take my kids to Vanderbilt, they always say, oh, it's so pretty. And I remind them how much warmer it is in Nashville than in South Bend <laughs> and how much more of a city there is than there is in South and Bend. Their, and their mother may more likely visit in the warmer climate. That's, than that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, you know, so I think that um, I think that there's some interest, but I, I I really want them to to find their own path, not, you know, like sure. like I said, I I got there a little bit by accident and mm -hmm. um, with a with a lot of luck and made it my home for five years. So well, it, it's I'm not trying to wish those those years away uh, quickly for you and your your crew, but hopefully at least one of them will find their way to Nashville to keep the black and gold tradition alive. Megan, I, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us this evening, getting to, to know you and learn your, your path and your stories. It's been a, a fun hour, so thank you. Well, thanks for having me. This was, this was a lot of fun. I was a little nervous, and then I realized, you know, I'm just telling my, <laughs> my right. story. And, and that's what makes these conversations every Tuesday night so fascinating. It's we're telling the oral history of the Vanderbilt football program, and is mixed in with that life on campus, life off campus, and, and just what makes each of our stories so unique to Vanderbilt and to each of us. Uh, again, Megan, I want to thank you. I hope you guys have a good holiday season. I know that Thanksgiving, believe it or not, is right around the corner. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll sneak out a victory against Florida this weekend. And you guys, <laughs> anchor down. Anchor down. Thanks, Thanks for having me. We'll see you next Tuesday night with another conversation with Commodores.